Okay, today is class 19 of CAD 212 on Monday, April 19th. Today in class, we're basically this, the next two weeks, we're going to be starting um, what's called the construction documents phase. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, basically, that's going to be moving into uh, really kind of bringing all your projects together as the definition says here, um, construction documents phase builds upon the design development work by producing the plans, drawing specifications needed to price and build the project. So we should be at a point where most of our work is it's actually done with our building and our model. Uh, we're still gonna be tweaking stuff um, as we go along and we're still have some new stuff to do, but a lot of the work should be focused towards um, construction documents and pulling that together and what that means. So we'll kind of go through that over the next two weeks. Um, today in class, we're gonna talk about tags, doors, windows, rooms, what a room separator is and how to use the room tags. Uh, we'll talk about room schedules. A lot of this is stuff that um, it builds upon what you learned before with the schedules and then also the sheet lists. Uh, we're gonna just review that again. Um, so that's fresh in your mind. Important dates that you need to keep in, um, keep in your mind. Uh, Monday, May 3rd, the project is due by noon, entire project. So we've got two weeks for that uh, to be finished. Um, Wednesday, May 5th is your final exam. It will start at 9 a.m. and it'll be very similar to your midterm exam. Um, and we'll go over that a little bit closer to when we need to get started. Um, so we'll go ahead and talk about um, the sheet list of what you need to do to kind of start pulling your project together where you need to kind of start bringing that and start um, so we can be working in this construction document phase. So in Canvas, I also have another sheet for you called Final Project Sheet List. Um, this is going to go over exactly what sheets that you're going to be needing in Canvas. You'll find this under uh, a new file called Final Project and under Final Project. Let's see, we'll take a look at it. Well, see, spring, to, uh, spring 2021 under Final Project, you have your sheet list and then also put in here the sheet information. So we'll just open that real quick so you can see that. That's just a refresher on what the sheets break down into. I do have that listed for you, but I wanted to give this for it to you also. Uh, so we'll go ahead and jump back to the sheets that are needed. And the entire final project for the renovation model, we are all going to be using sheet E1 is 30 by 42, much larger sheet than we've been using before. And it's just kind of fun to see the difference between those small sheets we were playing with earlier and then how a proper set of plans looks on a large set, uh, on a large sheet set. So um, we'll see the difference in that. Um, a lot of this stuff you've done before, the G101, you'll create a title sheet. G102, your general information sheet. On that, you'll include your vicinity map, your table of contents and the schedules on this part. Um, schedules usually do have their own sheet. Um, if we look at the sheet numbers, you'll notice that they do go into a different section. Uh, A902 is for your schedules. We're just putting them on our general information sheet for this class, just so um, we have more information on our general information sheet because uh, we just wanna work on getting that organized. Um, after that, for your architectural sheets, you'll obviously need a site plan, um, first, second, third floors, a201, 202, 203. Um, you'll have all your elevations. Um, depending on how the sheet looks and how you organize it, you may get them all on one sheet or you may need to have increasing sheets. Uh, we'll see what happens there. Um, building sections, you will have to have at least four different section views on your A3201. Um, and once again, four minimum. And then, you know, depending on how you want to lay out the sheet, you can add more whatever you think is interesting to draw attention to. We'll also have an interior section in this part, A801 plus, and your interior section uh, will be your first floor plan with just your interiors in it. We'll talk about how we're gonna do that later. Um, there's also a usage plan that we're gonna be creating. We'll learn how to do that in the next class. 
and then also a bunch of renderings. Uh, renderings are really kind of the fun part once we get to uh, this more advanced stage where our model is looking really good, where we can really kind of show off your work here. Um, so this is the minimum that's required, but I always do like to see more renderings um, and see how you can kind of show it off. So that's always nice. So that's pretty much a thorough breakdown of what's needed for your final project. And this will be due um, Monday, May 3rd by noon, so after class. And remember anything that's turned in after the deadline, um, most you'll be able to receive is a B. Uh, just think of it as like to, uh, getting all your project documents ready to bid on a project. If you miss the deadline for a bid, you don't get to bid on it. So it's kind of the same thing here, which is why we have the deadline of 12 noon. All right, let's jump back into Revit stuff. Any questions about the sheets before I move on? We'll be, we'll be working with this. I'll be working with you throughout this, uh, how to get this done and okay, we'll, we'll be playing with sheets, you know, throughout class. So anything that comes up, just let me know. All right, um, so for today for class, we're gonna talk about tags first. Uh, it's not really a long class today, but it's a lot of good information and what your goal should be is to make sure that this is finished before next class, because this information, uh, next class will build on this information that's already going to be in your um, in your Revit project already. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Let's see who I have open. Let me go ahead and jump to level one. All right, on this one, the who's ever level one this is, uh, when we start putting this stuff on sheets, we're gonna wanna hide this stuff and we'll talk about that when we get there. And I have some other stuff I wanna kind of review with, with a couple people um, when we get a chance. So just let me get through this class and then I'll open it up for questions and um, other stuff. All right, so let's talk about tags and how we want to actually start laying out this stuff for our sheets. <clears throat> So on here, it's nice to see the floor and stuff like this and see how things are kind of laid out. But once you start, as I'm sure you've noticed, putting this stuff in um, a sheet, it starts to get really busy, especially with all these extra lines and stuff. We do want to leave the section views for now. Uh, we want to have that on our regular um, floor plan sheet. But you'll notice the more stuff we start putting in here, the more that these floors get in the way and they get really busy. So we're going to go into visibility graphics and turn those off. So remember that's VV or VG. So I'm going to go down to my floors, uncheck that. If I hit apply, it turns those off. Or I can just hit OK and turn those off. So I've got something that looks like that. So there's a couple of different ways that we can tag stuff. So you're going to go to annotate tab to your tag panel, and then you'll notice that there's two tag tools here. Uh, we'll just go ahead and do tag by category first. So we'll click on that. What's nice about Revit is that it automatically will have everything set for you for your tag. The doors are numbered by the way that they were put in. You can change the door number if you want. So they go one, two, three, four. Um, so this was the 20th door that was inserted into this project. If the first door was deleted, then it starts over again. So you can go back and start renumbering those. So you can just tag those along like that. And um, this project does not have any actual windows in it that are preset windows. These are all curtain wall windows. So it's also going to pick up, if you remember how we looked at symbols, wall types. So that is the tag symbol for a wall type. And you can write in curtain wall here. So we have all our curtain walls. Let me just drop a, a window in here so you can see the difference between the two. Look, 
Doesn't that create a, okay. Let's, let me just put it somewhere weird. Uh, I'll just put it in this wall so we can at least tag it. All right. Um, back to annotate tab, tag by category. And you see when we come in here and tag that actual proper window, um, it's going to give us that window tag for that window. So you don't need to, if we did want to um, add additional wall tags, we could do that. You don't need to do that. It's nice to know that you can do that, but we're not going to be doing that throughout this project. Um, we don't have a lot of, depending on how complicated these projects are, sometimes you want to notate where like the fire rated walls are as opposed to just the uh, regular walls or structural walls. There's, um, but for, for your project, um, just windows, doors, tags, you can tag the um, curtain walls as well just by doing what I just did here. And then we'll do the room tags as well. Uh, we can move these guys around. So they're kind of compact and kind of less in the way. I kind of like to do that. So they're kind of more flush with the door. So you can move the location of those. I just think they look cleaner here. So there's some hoops. Oh, I moved that wall. Ooh, there we go. They just look a lot cleaner when they're closer to um, the doors that they're tagging. And it's just kind of how this is cutting into this other wall here. I don't like that either. So I'll just kind of move that. So it's spaced a little better here. And I'll just, that just takes a little time as far as how you want to get that arranged. So that's our first floor. Let's jump to our second floor. <clears throat> I want to do the same thing on this floor. We'll hit visibility graphics, VV. Turn off our floors here. Hit OK. So, um, another thing that you want to notice on here um, before you put this on a sheet, one of the things that we want to do is actually turn off the view that's below because you can still see the first floor walls on this project. And a lot of times that gets confusing, especially in our uh, actual document drawing documents. So we want to turn off that view. It's good to have it on while you're drawing, but when you get to the point where you're putting this stuff on a sheet, it can get a little uh, confusing. So in order to turn off that view, we're going to go back to our properties. We're going to scroll down to underlay and notice how it says range base level is level one. It means we can see level one. If we turn that to none, it's going to turn off those walls from floor one and it just makes things look a lot cleaner. So you do want to do that um, as you progress through the project on levels two and level three. So it's only reflects the um, actual walls of the floor that you're working on. <clears throat> All right, um, another way to tag stuff is still annotate tab, tab, tag panel. You can do tag all. Um, I'm not crazy about tag all. I just rather just do it by category, but sometimes you will, you may forget something. So if you do want to do tag all, you can do that as well. So we can go ahead and click on that, make that active. Uh, there's two ways you can do that. You can do all objects in current view or only selected objects. So you can't select the objects that you want to tag, um, but it's just as easy to do all objects in current view. And then you just click on what you want to tag. So we would still want to do door tags. Here we'll do, we'll include wall tags and see what happens with that. And then we'll include window tags as well. If you want that leader on here, you can um, just click that and make it active. Let's do it both ways and see what happens. So we'll leave it off this time. I'll hit apply, we're okay. So we have something that looks a lot busier when we do that. And that's because we have done, uh, we've included our wall tags on here as well. And it's tag, obviously all our walls and it looks really busy. Um, so not great. Um, oops, I don't want that. I do want help, but not right now. All right, let's go back. Okay, cancel. Let's just undo that. Go back to tag all and we'll do just doors 
in Windows this time. So we did that without a leader. And notice that they just kind of sit within the door frame, which makes things look a lot nicer. I kind of like that a little bit better. Uh, and then we can also go back and go to tag by category, and then we can just go back in and tag our curtain walls that we have. And then once again, if I did have a loaded window in here, it would have populated as well. And then lastly, we'll just do the same thing on the third floor. Visibility graphics. Oops. Turn off our floors. Go to our range level for our underlay where we can see the different uh, floors from our second floor. We'll turn that off to none. Now we just have our uh, rooms on our second, on our third floor. I'll do tissue tag all again. I'll do door tags and window tags. Oh, there's no windows in here. <laughs> and then we'll use the leader this time. I'll hit OK. And then notice that we have all that set. And then I can go back and add in my curtain wall tags. I'll just do that one for now. So you get the point. <clears throat> so these are really easy tags to use. Um, any questions about that? That's pretty straightforward. Next thing, I did doors and window tags. Next, we'll talk about rooms. Uh, rooms are just a little bit more complicated and the room tags are what leads to the um, color schedules and the room uh, schedules. So we'll do that next. Uh, so dump back to that. Go back to floor one. So now we've got everything kind of set up here. Um, in order to do just room tags real easily, you want to go to architecture tab to our room and area panel. And we're just going to use the room. And notice when that comes in. It comes in with some information on here. That keeps getting a lot busier and busier. So in order to make this a little bit easier to, to read, we can go ahead and change our view scale. <clears throat> if we come over to properties on view scale, if we just want to make that A little bit bigger gives us a little bit more room there. <clears throat> and when you're putting your sheets together, this is where you want to think about how things are going to be read. You want things to be read really easily. So it's just a matter of organizing your information so it's easy to find and easy to read. <clears throat> so along with the room tags, if you go to edit type, um, in here you can show volume. If we have certain settings, we're not going to worry about that, but we do want to show the area of the room. So we'll click on show area. And that's going to give you the square feet of each room, which is really nice. You can also change the name. You can name that hall or circulation. Uh, it's good where we have like janitor's closets and stuff like that. If you have like different, like say this is um, an office and I, you're going to be required to do uh, rename all these rooms.
So just name this testing. So you should have all your rooms named for next class. So I have those guys laid out like that. Uh, we'll go ahead and jump to level two. Let's do that one more time. <clears throat> level two will have the same thing. Um, <clears throat> Say this, this room right here is actually supposed to be divided into two separate useful areas. Now let's do this one. So like part of this is a lab and part of this is a lecture hall. Um, you can separate this into two spaces. It's one room, but we wanna make sure that we can notate that the room is used for two different things. So in order to do that, we have to use a room separator. This is also used, say, in residential, where you have like a great room and you want to show what section is technically the kitchen and what section is technically the living room, so you can get an idea of what those square feet are. So um, we'll go ahead and click on room separator. And basically, it's just like a line that's going to denote which part is which. So when we come in with our room tag, um, it will show there's two separate useful areas here. So let's go ahead and tag this area as well. So we'll start here. Notice even though that this is the second floor, it's picking up the same room numbers. It's continuing the same num the numbers like numerically, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Sometimes this is gonna get a bit confusing. So we're gonna wanna go back and change the room numbers as well. So we'll do that next. So this notice here where that room separator is, I have a room here and then I also have a room here. And then finally we have this large space here. So when you're doing your rooms for your here, you may wanna change this to uh, 201, 202, 203. That way, you know, and I'll go back, I would go back and change these to 101, 102, 103, et cetera. Because when we start putting this in a sheet list, it'll start getting, uh, it'll start making more sense. So if we go back here, let me change the scale of this. <clears throat> Looks nicer so we can read it a bit better. And then finally, let's do floor three. Let's use our room separator one more time. We'll do this section right here. Actually, no, I don't want to do that because it's going to section off in that curtain wall. I'll do it right here. And maybe this, this section over here is just like a large storage area or something. And then we can come back with our room tags. <clears throat> Oops. Okay, that's a lot cleaner. <clears throat> then I'm gonna to wanna to come back and uh, change all these names on here as well, change the names on the second floor as well. But notice the difference between when I started just kind of laying out my numbers on this one, uh, when I went back to 201, um, 
I have to renumber all of these. So on the third floor, I did that first. So then the numbers change. So you may want to pay attention to that when you start laying out your numbers. Uh, change that first before you lay out all the rest of them. So it's 301 and it did 302. So it does matter how you, um, the order that you do stuff in as well. <clears throat> Uh, this space also has some outdoor space, but we're going to leave that separate from our rooms. So that's why I didn't tag this area as well. This is our, um, there's a patio area here. Any questions about this so far, y'all? Okay, cool. All right. Next thing we want to move on to is how to do room schedules. In our room schedules, it's very similar to how we did our sheet list before. We have done that before. I'm just going to go over this again as a refresher. But it's very similar to how we did this before. Um, but for your room schedules, you're going to have them listed as number, name, and area. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, for room schedules, we want to go to View tab. We're going to go to the create panel and the schedule tool should look familiar if we do that drop down there remember the only thing we wanted to hit is schedules and quantities and here we want to pick um, what we want to create our schedule about and we're going to scroll down to rooms double click on that and i said number name and area Remember, if you do bring these in in the wrong order, you can arrange them, rearrange them with these arrows. So number, name, area, and then we just hit OK. And here's why it's real important to have your name in rooms in a, in, a, in a name and also the floors. So you can see that we have one, two, three, four. Um, if we number them by 101, 102, 103, we know this is a section that's on the first floor. We'll know these are our second floor rooms and we'll know these are our third floor rooms. And then also a breakdown of the different types of rooms that we're gonna be using. Um, this will come into play a lot more in the next class when we learn some new stuff there. Um, but this is why you wanna have all this stuff kind of organized and set. Um, room schedule is nice to have. Um, and we'll use that for another sheet um, for our final project, for our final portfolio. Uh, let's see, any questions about doing room schedules? It's real easy, just like the other schedules. All right, and last thing for today, we'll just go ahead and do a little reminder of like how to do our sheets. <clears throat> We've done that before. So that's going to be in our view tab, create panel, schedule tool, uh, sheet list. And we're going to do the same thing that we did on our sheet list before. We're going to go by sheet number and sheet name. I haven't created any sheets yet. So when I do this, it's not going to have anything listed. Um, so as we populate that information, it will get added later on. So. And just a little refresh there. As um, you start working on this part, you remember you can start adding your sheets. Um, if you want to start just kind of putting them in there so you know which ones you need to do, you can go ahead and start doing that and get your sheets organized. Uh, if you do need to change stuff, remember it does populate and does update on you. It does update your sheets with, as you do it but the renderings do not update. We still have probably have a little bit of work left on that. Any questions about today's lecture? No? Okay. I just wanna go over a couple of things in a couple of drawings um, while we have time. So uh, I, I appreciate y'all turning in your work and so I can review your drawings. And I noticed a couple of people had some issues with the site plan, so we're gonna talk about that real quick. But on this particular project right here, I did notice a couple of things. Uh, this ceiling is still low. Uh, the ceiling, um, so that does need to be adjusted for who has every project this is. And then um, we've got a weird uh, problem with the floor uh, here. And I, um, let me bring that to your attention. So there's a couple of different things we want to think about when we're doing floors. This joist floor that we have in place is actually one solid floor. Um, it was created kind of like a finished floor. 
Uh, meaning that, let me go back to level two. Let me turn this stuff back on. Let me turn my floor back on. Let me hide these interior walls. I hit the floor. Come on. So <clears throat> this is the shape of what a solid finished floor would look like because they it was drawn um, around all the different walls and stuff like that. But since this is supposed to be a structural floor, it's not actually holding up our walls. So there's gaps between each one. So what I would do if I was this person is I would take this floor that you so meticulously drawn around each wall and change this to your actual finished floor and then go back in and put in a solid structural floor using the same, this material, using your wood joist 10 inch. But as you can see, when we hit those walls, we have gaps. Um, you know, where, you know, flooring should be underneath that. So let's just go ahead and fix that real quick while we can. Um, what I would suggest is creating a new material and a new material floor. The entire second floor will have the same flooring, but that's fine, however you wanna refix that. Uh, but just to save time, we'll just make it one floor type. <clears throat> so in order to do that, we're gonna go to the architecture tab. Um, actually, we'll go to, floor tool, and I just want to see what floors that we already have in here. All right, so I'm going to make a new floor. I'll just make that a finished floor. Edit type. I'll make this quarter of an inch. And I'm just going to use the carpet that's already in there. I don't want to actually create any material and all that stuff, but I'll just use the carpet that's already there. User under appearance. Okay. And okay. Oops. And I'm going to offset that quarter of an inch. Check mark. Okay, so here it does work. I just have it in this one particular room right here. Um, so I've got that working. And I do have that built now. So the only thing I want to do now is go ahead and click on the floor that is already in place and make it active. And then I'm going to swap that out for the new floor that I just made. Oh no, is that my, is that the one that I just made? No, that's the one I just made. So now I've made the entire second floor solid again with uh, just that carpet. If I go to my 3D view, my floor is much thinner now, it's not protruding here. Now I can go back and add that proper second floor level. So now I'm gonna hide this. I need to turn my other walls back on. Hide the carpet. All right, I have no supporting floor. Then we come back to our floor. We're just going to use the 10 inch joist. Remember, here's where we're just going to we can pick lines and just follow this around. But it's all of our 
exterior walls. Very complicated floor plan and make sure I have everything closed. I think that's supposed to be there. Wait. All right, let's use this corner tool to kind of make this look a little bit better. This really complicated one. All right, let's see what happens. I think I got it all. Lines must be closed loop. I'm missing one. Who am I missing? Uh, down here. Continue. I'll draw this last one in. Okay. So it's telling me the highlighted floors overlap. So if I look over my properties, I didn't change my height offset from my other one. I do want this height offset set to zero. And now I have a solid second floor found um, structural floor now. Notice when I hide the wall, that wall that there's now, um, you know, flooring underneath the walls. If I turn everything back on, we've got something that looks a little weird. It's still off a little bit. So let's select this floor. That's my wood joist floor. I'm going to go to third floor. I mean, 3D, sorry. Sometimes Revit is just a matter of like playing through all this and trying to get things to lay out like you want it to. It can be a little tedious and time consuming, but it's just a matter of getting things just right. So now I need to get that. Let me hide this. There's my finished flooring again. I'll set that back to half a quarter of an inch. Uh, not three inches, quarter of an inch, please. Inches. All right, so I did not cut out this opening here, so that does need to be fixed. That, um, but now you can see that we have a finished floor and a structural floor, and that the finished floor is now laying on top of the structural floor. So whoever's project this is, you do have to jump through all those hoops to get that correct, please. Um, but at least, you know, it kind of gives you an idea how to do it. You don't need to, it may be quicker to redraw the entire thing, but you don't necessarily have to, it's just a matter of changing the floor types. Um, that has to be corrected for the model. And once again, that would be turned off um, for your sheet itself. Any questions? Hey, about uh, the concern of the ceilings, um, like you said they were too low. Yes. Like, does that need to be flushed up against like the bottom yes. of like the floor? Yeah. Okay. So uh, from this angle, you can see where those ceilings are right there. If we click on just the ceiling and it's set to eight foot and then these are set to um, it's 10 inches so it's usually set to nine foot two. Let me just set this to nine foot and see where that's going to bring me. So I still got that little gap right there. It's real thin so it's hard to see it so if we set that to 
nine foot two it might be too much yeah Nine, one. Yeah, you can leave it at nine one. It'll still leave this little gap right here, but the, the thickness of this um, ceiling should be at least like half an inch. So that would make up for that difference. Uh, it's a real thin ceiling. But yeah, the only difference that you need to do to get those ceilings corrected is to change the height offset. And then you could just do that for all of them at the same time. You know, remember, select all instances and you can kind of do it like that. Okay, um, what else about this one? Uh, I think there's some issues with elevations and stuff. Let me go ahead and go over the whole site lecture again. If you don't feel like listening to it, you can go ahead and drop, um, but it will be part of the lecture uh, in the recording. Um, let me go ahead and jump projects. All right, let's play with this one. Um, this is a really busy site plan. And notice because there's the elevations and we have some like um our parking uh, areas are at a different level and stuff like that so it does get a little complicated when we start laying in a bunch of elevations and things so sometimes it's a matter of like how we want to do it so what i'd suggest for this is just get rid of this site <laughs> sorry um it'll just be easier uh, what is this Oh, those are your, uh, when, they're, when they're on an angle, they get a little bit uh, busy as well. So that's, um, and delete those. And there's ways that we can put our parking um, lots, parking spaces on angles and things like that. If the, if the site is sloped and stuff like that, um, let's see. Let's just go to visibility graphics. Right. So I don't want to turn off the site that I'm doing. Just delete all these. Kind of get it cleaned up a little bit. Okay. So back to my site plan view. So here's our large site that's kind of laid out with our property line, which is nice. Uh, and once again, we're going to go into our massing and site tab. And we'll start with our top of surface. And it's a lot easier to just kind of go along and get a couple of elevations in here at the start. We can just do a few like that. I want to bring that to zero. I have that laid out so this section is flat. And then to finalize it, I'll have a slope that goes down like that. Let's hit the green check mark and go to 3D, see what it looks like. So in here, how I've kind of planned it is that in this back part, I have some slopes, I have some elevations, some high elevations for my property. Uh, and then as I laid it out, I 
have it set for a, that this area is going to be flat and then this slopes down. Um, and this will make it easier for me to do my parking lot on uh, to keep that as a flat area. So you can just do it like that just to make things a little bit easier for yourself because if we add a lot of the undulations that that other site had, it just kind of will make you a little bit crazy. This is looking nice up here. Um, let's see. Let's do that one more time. Just another idea for that. Let's go to site level view. Uh, top of surface tool. So if you want to start at zero, just click here, here. There, there. Now let's make this five foot from here to here. Why it would be, I don't know. I don't know. It would, it would look, it's going to look silly, but let's just do it so we can have play. And let's set it back to zero. And hit our green check point, check mark. Let's go ahead and jump back to 3D, see what we did. Got something weird that looks like that. What I did when I, when I laid it out like this um, was so that you could see that we have a flat area for our parking lot here. This does go up so it intersects the house so we can go ahead and practice that way that we can set our points to all zeros so that it's at least flat around the house as well. And then we have this slope around the back. So it's also a way to, for you to kind of play with landscaping as well. So I do have my flat area from a parking lot, but right here I do have how the ground is like way up into my building and I wanna get rid of that, I wanna fix that. So in order to fix that, remember that I find the easiest ways to just turn the whole model over. We're gonna use split surface. Click on the surface that you wanna split and we're just gonna draw that shape around um, the building that we want removed. I'll hit the green check mark. And remember, most people forget to do anything after that, but the ground is still there because if we hide this, you'll see that there's still ground under that. So now we want to make sure that we can pick that. We don't do it right away, it gets a little awkward. Just trying to find the right thing that we want to select. All right, so I finally did get the topography back and that's when I hit delete. All right, I can put everything back on. I have a question about um, selecting the ground at that point. Mm -hmm. Do yep. you just have to kind of keep hiding things and clicking around to try to get it? Because I was struggling with that too. Like I, I kept trying to click on the floors and the walls and like everything that was inside the building and everything but the ground and I could not get it to delete yep. it. It's going to drive you crazy. So unless you do it like right away before you do anything else, once you do the split surface, you're going to have to kind of figure out how to find it. I wish there was a better way for me to tell you, but there's not. So it's just a matter of hiding stuff in order to actually grab what you want to. But you see how it is. It's going to pick everything else. So I hid the slab and I hid the front of this building. And now I can see just this edge of the ground right here, and that's how I got that. I know it's the correct thing because it says topography over here, and I can just hit delete. So yeah, it's just a matter of getting the right angle to get it to work for you. It is frustrating. All right, so let's turn everything else back on. So now we still, we cut the ground out from inside the house, but we still have the ground like high up over the house intersecting our uh, the building, intersecting our walls and all that stuff. We wanna have all this um, ground here set to zero. So it lays on the same level as that. How do we do that? Well, we turn it back over again. We click on the site, make it active. We go to edit surface. 
And remember, there's all these points here have different uh, elevations. So we're going to just select the points that are all around the perimeter of the slab with those active. We can't really see they're active because I've got, so let's change it to hidden lines. So with those active, you want to set all those elevation points to zero. That will finish that. And then we got to hit, go hit the green check mark. Notice everything else changed at the same time that we fixed that. Let's go ahead and turn this, let's turn the color on it on. And let's turn it over. And notice we still have this flat area back here for our parking lot but all the points around the perimeter of the building are now set to, what is this? That topography did not delete. Now it's gone. I think I, I grabbed an extra point. What is that? All right, so this one is a little complicated too because there are a lot of extra points on here. So when you do pick stuff, you wanna make sure that you're picking the right thing. In order to do that, let me go back and do one other thing there. So at this point, we wanna select all of these points here. Um, we didn't use this tool before, but it's good that this came up so you can use this new tool. There is a filter. If we click on this filter, it will tell you, okay, I do only have boundary points selected. If I did select additional stuff that shouldn't be selected, it would point pick up here and I just want the boundary points. I'll show you how that works a little, a little bit more extensively in a second. So hit okay. All boundary points set to zero. Check mark. And then we have that flat on there and you can use this area as your as your um, parking lot so you can go back and add that information now at that time and you have a flat surface to do that. So it re it refix that so your actual site looks like the dimensions that we want it to look. And then you can just add the, the different parts after that. Does this make a little bit more sense than what the previous one was? Um, can you go back to the 3D on the angle view of the whole site? So like the building now is sitting flat on the site surface, right? right. But how, Okay, so it looks like it's kind of still underneath it. Is that how it's supposed to be? Well, this part's right around. So if we kind of rotate this real slowly around, see it's flat here, it's flat here, it's flat all the way around these points. Every point that is around the house is now set to zero. So it's going to be flat. You're gonna have these arched bits here uh, because those areas are higher. So, I mean, it's not, honestly, it's not optimal because you don't never want to have like the rain running towards your house. <laughs> you know, if it's raining, we're just going to having all this water rush towards the building. Um, so, you know, there's like, other ways. Is slab supposed to be under the ground? The slab is supposed to be under the ground. Okay, yes. so that's That right. is correct. So yes, this is set to, remember this is set to uh, level one, but it goes down because it's a slab. So this is, yeah, the ground is, you know, flush with level one and the slab is below grade. So if you go around the building, select all the points for the topography and you set it to zero, it's really only gonna make, like it's only gonna be correct if the way the, the topography is set is where zero would be. I'm yeah. So if I, <laughs> like if, I took, if I took this and I did edit surface again and I selected all these points around here again, and what if I set them to like negative one? Let's do, actually do negative two. Oops. Yeah. Negative two feet. Let's go to 3D and see what happened there. 
So now we can see that there's a big gap. So it's below the building. It's an opening here. It doesn't look like the house is actually set in the site at all. Where before when it was set to zero, it was right between this, um, this ledge and the slab. So what if on their building site, the elevation was higher? Like what if your building's on a hill? How would you set the elevation for the building to where the site for it is like a flat surface? Because I think that's kind of what was going on before. That's how I had the site laid out and I was getting super confused. But I know that you said to simplify it. But just, how <laughs> yeah, that it should be just the dimensions that it's supposed to be. Um, and it does not have to have that many uh, undulations in it, but let's let's um, address your question. Okay. Go to site. Like, I guess what I'm asking is if you had a site that did have a lot of elevation changes, how would you set it for the building in the parking lot to be on a level surface? Is there a way to make that like a level plane? There's a couple of ways that you can do that. And all of it has to do with how you set the elevations and stuff like that. If you set the elevation around just the parking lot site, you can make that flat. Um, so if I did this, if I wanted to make it like on a hill, let's see, negative 10. When I'm doing it, I don't want to create it to make it complicated for me because you're basically creating the site as it is. You're not, you're not needing to go back and like undo it. So I would always make sure that I plan a zero level when I put it in. So I know I have a flat area because it's a lot easier to do that than to go in and place a bunch of points and then create it flat. Does that make sense? So if I go back to 3D, let's see what happened when I did this. So I've got something weird that looks like that. So here we have it like low. I want this connected to the house here. So we're kind of almost doing the opposite. And it gets a little more complicated here because I'm not gonna be cutting out the site first. Um, I don't know, it's just weird how you do just different options on it. So let's just let's just try it this way. Let's click on this. Edit surface. Yeah, that's not gonna work. I do need to have that intersected split surface. All right, with that still active, if it's still active and I haven't clicked anything else, I can just hit delete to get rid of that. I'm going to go to edit surface, pick those points, set those to zero. Let's flip it over, see what happens. getting a little bit more there. So it's kind of sloping up instead of a, a to the house, it's sloping down, which looks a little bit better. And we still have this flat area in the front where we can place our parking lot information. Now, if we wanted it to be a little bit back, we could also go back and let's turn it this way, click on this, make it active, edit surface. If I wanted to place a point, and I wanted it at zero elevation. When I place a point, notice how that's going to bring that elevation out a little bit more. I think this is what was probably happening because it gives us these weird shapes. 
can also take that and pull that back. Oops. I have a little bit more space to lay out. Yeah, mess that up. What is that point set up? That's at negative 10. Let's set that to zero. All right, that's better. So you can see it does get a bit complicated and I don't want you to make it too complicated. Um, you can make it still an interesting site without overcomplicating things. The important thing is when you're laying out your site area to have, you know, think about that area that you want to be set to zero because when you're creating that site, um, that's going to be set to zero anyway, or it's set to that level space or whatever the actual elevation is that you get from your survey, your land survey. Um, we can lay in actual points that are from a land survey that give you the correct undulations of the ground. But as we're creating this, your project here, you don't want to get too complicated in it. You want it to, because um, you may be making it like topography that's just not necessary to put your building on. But this one will give you a few little undulations and stuff. And then you can always go back and if you still want to edit your property, if you still want a few more, um, say in this back area, we could go back in. Let's go ahead and click that, edit it again. Um, we'll go ahead and place a couple more points. So if we wanted to make that like two, two feet here, actually maybe like 12 foot, and just drop a point there. I could add some more elevations like that, but I did keep that flat area for my parking lot still. If I wanted this to go down further, I could change the elevation of this point and have it go down, but I wouldn't make it too complicated. You know what? You know, we're not making a golf course. Um, does that help? I think I should, yeah, help, it, I think I should help both people that were having issues with the uh, site. I guess, yeah. I guess like what really is like the root of my question. I'm just wondering if mm -hmm. like you were working on a project that did have different elevation and you're when you do how like what we're doing going around the building and setting it at zero, mm -hmm. what if it's not at like zero feet? What if it's at, you know, three feet, five feet? Would you just set the building at whatever the elevation is that you want your building pad set on if the elevations were different in like a real world situation, not just zero? Or do you always set zero? It's just kind of like your base level. Um, in here, well, it's just kind of like a few different parts to that to answer. Um, if you have different elevations on your building, a lot of that's going to be set ahead of time with your levels. Say if this was a raised building, we would create our levels first. Mm -hmm. And the level would be like, um, you would have a lot more, you know, you'd have like piers and things like that. So you'd have your different level sets. Uh, our site level is always gonna come in at level zero. And that may, um, if your actual site from the points that you're getting from your uh, survey are different, then you can add those in and it'll, it'll add that um, fluctuation for the ground in. But when we're actually building the building, it should be on a flat surface. So the, the site itself, I don't know, if we go back to, do, 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 do. this may be easier to see it visually if we go back here. In this plan set that you have here, on here we have how what the actual elevations are kind of set here. Notice if you can, if we can take a closer look, they have sets of different heights and things. So that's what the actual elevation is, but the actual building is going to be placed on a flat area. So even though we have our different elevations here that are marked along here, and we do have them here, when we're actually creating it, we want it to be on a flat area. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, okay. Okay.
So it may be a little bit of an elevation difference between these two points, but basically we want to have it laid out as, as a flat area. You're not going to have anything. If you have something that's built on a hill, uh, like a parking lot that's built on a hill, we can change the way that these parking stripes lay out in, in order to do that. Um, we can talk about that next class um, to have that. But I, I think that kind of covers it. Is that correct? Do you? Yeah, no. You can slope these and we can talk about that next time, but we'll, we'll, we can do that next time. But notice that the if for your drawing itself, it's still on a, you know, flat and we're not, um, you're not actually going to be using the 3D, 3D is more, the Revit 3D model is more kind of like a selling point rather than um, an actual drawing. You're going to have separate drawings for your landscape and things like that. It will be different from this. So um, I don't want you to overthink what's going on here. Yeah, I know that makes sense now. Thank you. Okay, I hope that helps. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions, y'all? Oh, actually, I did have another question. Good. It's not related to the site plan, though. It's okay, that's not a problem. Interiors. It's what? The interiors, setting the lighting. Uh huh. Um, one of the lighting. First off, I did wonder. So I noticed there's two different folders in the lighting. It was the MEP and the architectural. What's mm -hmm. the one just more detail, like in the data of it, or what's the difference between the two different? Well, we use architectural for this one, and then we use MEP for the other one. And um, let me go ahead and jump that. Architecture components. So for the MEP class, we use strictly the MEP lighting. The architectural usually can have some um, more interesting pieces. Like if we look at the MEP for internal, uh, a lot of it is the same. Some of it is you know, just used, you know, more for one. See, this is kind of like not, not great. There's not a lot of difference between the two, um, but MEP is used more strictly just for MEP plans and architectural, like for these plans. Like in my MEP class, we'll use these instead of the architectural ones because we can line it out a little bit better. Um, looks like some of our recess lighting. Dark. Let me use a, a new file for this. <laughs> 